Hello, and welcome to the webinar for the release of the Health Minister's Guide on Zika and the Zika Action Guide for Health Ministers. I'm Kimberly Conkle, the Associate Director for Health and the Partnership Center at HHS. We took a few minutes to make sure as many participants as possible could get on the call, so thanks for your patience. Today we're going to discuss the Health Minister's Guide and the accompanying Action Guide to explore how it can be used to teach your community members about Zika. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Ann Shukat, Dr. Scott Santabinez, and Dr. Luis J. Ocasio-Torres presenting on our call. Given the size of our call, we probably won't be able to get to all of your questions. We encourage you to learn more about Zika virus at the CDC website at www.cdc.gov backslash Zika. You can send follow-up questions to CDC Info. The email address there is cdcinfo at cdc.gov. You can also tweet your questions to at cdc.gov or at partners for good, and the for is spelled out, F-O-R. If, if there are media on the phone, please call the CDC press office at 404-639-3286, and we will be posting a transcript of this call as soon as, it's poss as possible. We are delighted to have our first presentation from Dr. Ann Shukit, the Principal Deputy Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and a Rear Admiral in the U.S. Public Health Service. Dr. Shukit has been the Principal Deputy Director for CDC since September 2015. She also serves as the Director of the CDC Center for National, the Nas sorry, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases acting director for the National Center for Infectious Disease and the Center for Global Health, chief of the Respiratory Diseases Branch and chief health officer for CDC's 2009 H1N1 pandemic influenza response. Globally, Dr. Shukit has worked in West Africa on meningitis, pneumonia, and the Ebola vaccine trials, in South Africa on surveillance and prevention projects, and in China on Beijing's SARS emergency response. Dr. Shukit is a wonder for our country, and, we'll, and we're grateful to have her on our call. And we'll be discussing the Zika virus and its current spread in many countries and territories, including the United States. Thank you, Dr. Shukit, for joining our call. Please begin. And to help us reach out to the communities that you serve so that everyone can be more informed about Zika and how to protect themselves and those they love. Uh, next slide, please. The Zika virus is spread through the bite of an infected mosquito. And there are two kinds of mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti or the Aedes albopictus, which are the causes of spread of this virus. Most people who are infected with Zika virus won't have any symptoms at all, or they'll have very mild symptoms. But the Zika virus can cause birth defects and other ser serious problems like stillbirth and miscarriage. Before 2015, Zika outbreaks had been recognized in other parts of the world. There had been disease in Africa and Southeast Asia and in the Pacific Islands. Currently, outbreaks are occurring in dozens of countries or territories. The Zika virus can be spread when an infected mosquito bites a person. A woman who is infected during pregnancy can have the virus infect the fetus. We've learned recently that the virus can also be spread sexually. It's possible that the virus can be sped, spread through blood transfusion, and that's why we're now screening blood in the United States. And it's possible that the virus can be spread through other routes, but they have not been proven at this time. When people have symptoms with Zika virus, they're typically mild and include fever, rash, joint pain, and conjunctivitis, which is when your eyes are kind of red. Other symptoms that the virus can cause include muscle pain or headache. Most of these are quite mild and, and go away after a little while. Next slide. Anyone who lives in or travels to an area with Zika and who has not already been infected with the Zika virus can get it. Many people with Zika won't have any symptoms or they'll have mild symptoms. Symptoms can occur for several days to up to a week or so. Severe disease that requires a person to be hospitalized is uncommon. 
The virus can pass from a pregnant woman to her fetus during pregnancy or around the time of birth. We don't know yet how often this happens, but it's this particular problem that makes us so concerned about this virus. Zika infection in pregnancy can cause severe problems, including microcephaly and other severe fetal brain defects. Microcephaly is a birth defect which is evident when a baby's head is smaller than expected compared to babies of the same sex and age. That small head actually reflects a very small brain due to the nerve damage that the virus can cause. There's no evidence that a previous infection with Zika will affect future pregnancies. So someone who's already had Zika infection and recovered from it um, should not have to worry in a future pregnancy. Other problems that have been detected in fetuses and infants infected with the Zika virus before birth are miscarriage, stillbirth, absent or poorly developed brain structures, eye defects, hearing defects, and impaired growth. We don't know all of the effects that the virus can have, and that's a critical area for future study. There are no reports right now about infants getting Zika through breastfeeding. Unfortunately, as of today, there's no specific medicine or vaccine for Zika virus infection. The critical focus is on prevention. CDC activated our Emergency Operations Center to the highest level in January. We're providing on-the-ground support in areas where the Zika virus is spreading. We've been educating healthcare providers and the public about the virus and posting travel guidance as new information emerges. We've developed and provisioned laboratories with new diagnostic tests to help recognize this virus and have created and distributed Zika prevention kits to affected U.S. territories. We're conducting studies, including one to evaluate how long the Zika virus persists in various body fluids. CDC continues to work with partners around the world and here at home to monitor and report cases, conduct studies so we can learn more about the links between Zika and Guillain-Barre syndrome, a severe neurologic problem. We worked with state and local health officials to create action plans for improved preparedness and response and publish and continue to publish guidelines to inform the testing and treatment of people with suspect or confirmed Zika. We continue to update guidance about new emerging problems. We also disseminated our conclusions on the causal link between Zika and microcephaly. Every week, we update the official case counts for the U.S. states and territories. We report both travel-associated cases and cases of local transmission, which are, occur when the mosquitoes in an area have infected a person rather than a person has acquired the infection while traveling elsewhere. As of now, over 20,000 cases total have been reported in the United States territories and the continental U.S. Several thousand locally acquired cases have been reported in the territories, including Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. And as of September 16th, Florida is the only state that has documented local transmission here in the continental U.S. Our current case counts can be found at our website, um, which we're going to demonstrate to you here. And this is updated, as I mentioned, once a week and includes state-specific counts. I want to thank you so much for participating in today's um, webinar and hope that you really can take back to your ministries and to your communities the information that's vital to protect pregnant women and their loved ones against this terrible virus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shukit. We really appreciate you being here with us. And now we'll turn the time over to our second presenter, Dr. Scott Santabinez. Dr. Santabinez? Thank you, Kimberly. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to participate in this afternoon's webinar. It seems like every few years we hear about a new uh, emerging infectious disease threat. So in recent years, we've heard about H1N1 and Ebola and now Zika. 
if you don't have a healthcare background, it can be difficult to know what to make of all of these news stories. And to be honest, even for those of us who do have a healthcare background, it's tough to keep up on all of the new information that's constantly uh, coming out. So you may wonder, should I be concerned about Zika? Our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services have developed two new documents that can help you to answer this question. The Health Minister's Guide on Zika is actually one in a series of guides on a number of different health topics. And this particular guide is designed to help you, help your community understand more about Zika. The Zika Action Guide for Health Ministers gives you practical steps that you can do uh, to uh, combat Zika in your local community. Now, on this afternoon's webinar, I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to these two documents, but I won't be able to cover everything in these guides uh, this afternoon. So I encourage you, after the webinar, to go back and read these documents in detail. And also, visit CDC's website, www cdc.gov slash Zika, where you can find the most up-to-date information about Zika. So to start out, what did the authors of this guide mean uh, when they use the term health minister? Well, a health minister uh, could be a, a pastor, a priest, uh, an imam, a rabbi, uh, perhaps a parish nurse uh, who's interested in promoting health in his or her congregation. Or it could be really anyone in the community who's interested in health and wants to see his or her community be healthier. So we hope that this information is useful to you if you happen to be the leader of a, a faith community, but uh, we think it will also be useful for anyone in the community who wants to promote health. As community leaders, you have an important role in the fight against Zika. People in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. You understand the local culture and more than just understanding the local culture, you also understand the anxiety, the worries, the concerns that a woman or a couple uh, may have about Zika and how it might affect their pregnancy. So you can show compassion and sensitivity to people as they're thinking through and learning about this important issue. You may also have an important role uh, helping people to understand the needs of those who are the most vulnerable in our communities, helping to give a voice to those who don't have a voice. So you can help your congregation and community to understand that Zika can affect the most vulnerable among us. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, people in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. So when people face a major life decision or go through a big event or even encounter a tragedy, they're likely to turn to someone they trust. Uh, for example, this could be their rabbi or their pastor or their priest. And if you're like me, when you know that someone's going to ask you about something, you want to do your homework. You want to read up on the topic in advance. You want to look at the facts for yourself so you understand what's going on. So it's important to become knowledgeable about diseases like Zika. It can be a challenge to know where you can find reliable sources of information. And this is particularly challenging uh, if this isn't really your area of expertise or your area of, of training. And so this is where the Health Minister's Guide can help you. The Health Minister's Guide explains why Zika is dangerous, the role that you can have, and how people can reduce their risk of getting Zika. The Health Minister's Guide goes over some basic information about Zika, uh, which Dr. Shukat uh, covered a few minutes ago. Uh, this virus was actually uh, first identified in 1947 in Africa. And there have been smaller outbreaks over the years, but it's only been recently that the uh, virus has spread more widely in South Africa, or South America, excuse me, and uh, more recently to the United States. As Dr. Shukat mentioned, 
most people who get infected uh, won't have any symptoms at all. And even those who do get infected tend to have mild symptoms. They tend to uh, recover with just supportive care. Next slide, please. So the um, big concern with Zika is its potential effect on pregnancy. And uh, we've learned that Zika infection uh, in pregnancy can cause microcephaly and several other severe uh, fetal brain defects. Microcephaly is a condition where the fetus uh, brain has not developed properly during the pregnancy. So the baby's head is smaller than expected when compared to babies of the same sex and age. Now, CDC and other scientists have spent many months researching the question of whether Zika virus can cause microcephaly. And in fact, there's been uh, quite a lot of evidence uh, that we've found over these months uh, supporting this. Uh, we've actually found evidence of the virus in the brain cells of fetuses who uh, tragically have uh, died from uh, microcephaly. And um, I've recently looked at these slides myself, gone over them with a pathologist, and you can very clearly see the virus particles uh, in those cells. When we combine this with other evidence that we found, there's compelling uh, proof that Zika is a cause of microcephaly. We've also considered whether there are other explanations, other factors that could uh, relate to this uh, rise in, in microcephaly. And None of those other uh, possibilities have been found to be the cause. So we find this compelling evidence that Zika infection in pregnancy can cause uh, microcephaly. So how do we avoid microcephaly? Well, people primarily get infected with the Zika virus in two ways. Uh, people can get bitten by a mosquito that is carrying the virus and people can get infected through uh, sexual activity. So the easiest way to avoid getting bitten by a mosquito that's carrying the virus is just to avoid these mosquitoes altogether. The next slide, please. So we recommend that pregnant women should avoid travel to areas with Zika. Because the areas with ongoing Zika transmission can change over time, uh, we encourage people to go to CDC's website where you can find information uh, about uh, areas that have ongoing transmission. If a, a pregnant woman must travel to or be in an area with ongoing Zika transmission, we recommend that she use an EPA registered insect repellent, that she stay in buildings that have air conditioning or mosquito screens, and that she wear long sleeve shirts and long pants. Next slide, please. So on this video, we'll see where a young woman is uh, wearing long sleeves and pants. And as you can see, she's applying insect repellent on all exposed areas here on her feet and on her hands with a long sleeve shirt. And she will also apply the insect repellent on her uh, neck and her face. So any uh, areas where uh, there is exposed uh, skin. The next slide, please. Preventing the sexual transmission of Zika, as you know, is a sensitive issue. Uh, our research has shown that Zika can spread through sexual transmission. So it's important that pregnant women understand how to prevent sexual transmission of Zika so that they have the information they need to protect their fetus. Now, how and when these discussions take place is going to depend on the local culture, the local context. So this could involve you as a health minister having candid conversations with women or couples about Zika, if that's appropriate in your local context. On the other hand, you could help to create an environment where these discussions can take place. You could invite others 
uh, such as people from the, the health department, a local doctor or a nurse or a health educator, who can have private conversations with women or couples to answer questions that they may have about Zika. So, for example, uh, I have a pastor friend who, when it comes to uh, talking about preventing the transmission of another virus, of HIV, my pastor friend is really quite comfortable having candid conversations with his congregation uh, about that topic. And if that's the way it is in your setting, then that's perfectly fine. You can have those conversations. However, I know other uh, pastors who will say, we're not going to talk about that topic uh, during services. We don't think that it would be appropriate in our setting. But those same pastors will say, you know, what we can do is to uh, have a meeting. We can invite in people from the health department, a local doctor or a nurse uh, who can come in and answer questions that people may have, perhaps in a private setting where they can uh, uh, respond to uh, any, any questions or concerns that people want to uh, ask about. An added benefit that health ministers uh, can play is to understand the anxiety, worries, concerns, or fears that a woman or a couple may have about Zika and how it might affect their pregnancy. So you can show compassion and sensitivity uh, about these concerns as people learn about this disease. Next slide, please. You can refer to the Health Minister's Guide on Zika and CDC's website where you can find specific and detailed information about preventing sexual transmission. Keep in mind the goal is to prevent birth defects by educating women who are pregnant or who might become pregnant about how to protect themselves from Zika. Now decisions about pregnancy are, are personal, they're complex, and we recommend that they're best discussed uh, with a trusted healthcare professional. You as a health minister can have an important role to play in this process. Uh, you can, uh, for example, uh, if you have a young woman who's pregnant and a member of your congregation, uh, she wants to learn more about Zika and she's wondering if she should go and talk to her doctor. You can let her know that yes, this is a serious issue. Encourage her that she should go and talk to her provider. Uh, make sure that her questions are answered. She may want to write down her questions in advance to make sure that, that she has all of them uh, when she goes to see her doctor. And you can have an important role in reinforcing those public health messages from her physician or provider. Next slide, please. Now, you may have an important role in your community reminding people about the needs of those who are the most vulnerable uh, among us. As I mentioned, for a woman who's pregnant or thinking about uh, becoming pregnant, uh, her pregnancy and the health of her, her fetus uh, is potentially at risk. So you can see how Zika virus potentially affects the most vulnerable among us, those infants who are born with microcephaly. And Zika affects the most vulnerable in other ways as well. As I mentioned, uh, we recommend that pregnant women avoid mosquitoes by using insect repellents, by staying in buildings that have air conditioning or mosquito screens. But those who are struggling financially may not have access to, may not live in a house or an apartment that has air conditioning or mosquito screening. So it's more challenging for them to avoid the mosquitoes. In addition, they might live in areas of the city that are far away from manicured lawns and landscaping. They may live in areas that have debris that uh, collect standing water where mosquitoes like to breed. So this is another way it can be more challenging for them to avoid uh, mosquitoes. So it can be important for you to make sure your congregation understands that Zika affects some of the most vulnerable in our communities. Anytime an infant is born with microcephaly. This is a tragedy, but it's specifically, it's particularly challenging and tragic uh, when uh, a family lacks the resources to uh, care for an infant uh, with these special needs. The next slide, please. So the Zika Action Guide for Health Ministers 
gives you practical information uh, about what you can do to help prevent the spread of Zika in your area. And the action guide divides this by the phase of the response. And what that means is what you would do before mosquito season might be different than the actions you would take at the start of mosquito season. And this might differ when a first case of local transmission is identified in your area. Should Zika become more widespread in your area, then what you would do during active transmission uh, might still differ uh, in terms of the actions that you would take. I'm going to go over a few uh, general ideas of things that you can do. So the next slide, please. So the first thing you can do is to communicate. You can help to share fact sheets, uh, infographics, videos. CDC's website has a number of communication resources which you can use. And these are available in different languages. Uh, many of them use pictures for people who are perhaps lower literacy. So we encourage you to use them. Um, again, you are the most familiar with what works in your local area. So use those communication channels which best connect with the people in your community. The next slide, please. Second thing you can do is to collaborate. You can get to know your local health department and your local community health center. You might work together to organize educational sessions where people might learn about how to use insect repellent. They might learn about areas where mosquitoes tend to breed and grow and how to eliminate those areas. And they might have those private discussions where a young woman or a couple can ask her questions about Zika to a, a physician or a provider. You can also work with local businesses and employers to create a culture of health and wellness. There might even be some businesses in your area who would be willing to, for example, help install mosquito screens for pregnant women. So you can be creative and see what is available in your local area. In general, these types of relationships and these types of collaborations are useful not only for Zika preparedness and response, but also they're helpful for preparing for any type of emergency like a natural disaster. The next slide, please. You can also uh, help to clean up your neighborhood, uh, as this video shows. The Zika virus uh, and mosquitoes carrying that virus, uh, they tend to breed in areas where there's uh, water that's collecting. So this could be buckets. Um, this can be uh, the tops of uh, uh, garbage can lids. And here we see the, the larvae. Uh, these can be in bowls and animal dishes and in tires that uh, are abandoned and collect water. So what you might do would be to organize volunteers to go around and clean up some of these areas. And these types of activities uh, may resonate with people in your community because you're not only preventing Zika, but you're also helping to clean up the area and, and beautify the local community. So the next slide, please. So let's summarize what we've covered today. Zika is a serious health issue that can cause microcephaly and other severe fetal brain defects. Health ministers have an important role in the fight against Zika. People in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. You understand the local culture and you understand the anxiety, the concerns, fears, or worries that a, a woman or a couple may have about Zika and how it may affect their pregnancy. And you can help to show compassion and sensitivity uh, as people learn about this disease. You may also have an important role in helping people to remember the needs of those who are more vulnerable in our communities. So you can help your congregation and community to understand how Zika can affect the most vulnerable. I'd like to, again, thank everyone for uh, your time this afternoon. And again, I encourage you to go back and read the Health Minister's Guide and the Action Guide for Health Ministers closely. And also visit CDC's website where you can find the most up-to-date information about Zika. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santa Banez. We really appreciate you being with us and your walking us through the guide. I'm now uh, grateful to introduce our third presenter, Dr. Luis J. Ocasio-Torres. 
And Reverend Dr. Luis J. Ocasio-Torres is the director of the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Communities Office in the Office of the Governor of Puerto Rico. He has a doctorate in clinical psychology from Carlos Albizu University and a master's degree in divinity from Puerto Rico's Evangelical Seminary. He's also an ordained minister of the Presbyterian Church USA and serves as a pastor of the Hugh O'Neill Memorial Presbyterian Church in Old San Juan. Since his appointment by the Governor Honorable Alejandro Garcia Padilla, Reverend uh, Dr. Ocasio Torres has reached the faith-based and neighborhood communities of Puerto Rico in an effort to help communicate with this important sector. His office also has established partnerships with several government agencies and faith-based organizations to address their needs. In February, um, on February 5th, 2016, Governor Garcia Padilla created an executive order establishing Zika as a national public emergency. Ever since, the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Communities Office, with the collaboration of experts from the Puerto Rico Department of Health, have been contacting Puerto Rico clergy leaders determined to create awareness about Zika. Dr. Ocasio Torres, we are so grateful for all of your work in Puerto Rico and grateful that you're with us today. Take it away. Yes, it is my honor to be among you guys, uh, helping understand Zika, and I will be speaking today from a Puerto Rican perspective on Zika. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are many uh, cultural beliefs amongst, uh, about Zika, and uh, I was asked uh, how people reacted to Zika initially in Puerto Rico. Uh, at first, there was an initial disbelief. Uh, comments like Zika didn't happen in Puerto Rico, was something in Brazil or Colombia. That's, that's not gonna come to Puerto Rico, were very, very uh, common. Also believe that because Puerto Rico has uh, dengue or chikungunya, and we have battled with those before, uh, we knew how to handle Zika. Um, also, there was a, in media, there was a, a, a hashtag, I don't know anyone with Zika. And it was very popular among people. And I, I bet that many of our churches uh, or community projects, they usually say, that, well, that's true. I don't know anyone that has Zika. And that was uh, at first very, very, very common. The fact that there were so many unknown variables about the disease, such as the severity of symptoms, only pregnant women should care, conspiracy theories, among others, influenced the people to take Zika lightly. And I think that at first that was a, a struggle that we had, and it's not a, as common now, but we still are going through an education process. Perception at first that the government was overreacting or the, we were seeking money for the, for the island. Uh, also, we're in a, in a lot of, uh, in the media and among the, the chats between the fellow Puerto Ricans. And finally, furthermore, the other issues seem more important than Zika. For example, we, all, we started Zika, probably our first case was worth in December last year, and that's the, one of the busiest uh, flu season for us. And while we were having, a, I, I believe, over a thousand cases of flu, we only had uh, like 20 cases of Zika at that time. And the people thought that flu season were more important than, the, than Zika. There were also political issues. Well, we've been struggling with different uh, processes of economy, and many of the media uh, resulted those before uh, uh, Zika. Next slide. Second, uh, how people still react to Zika in Puerto Rico. We've been handling Zika for over nine months, and thinking and attitudes have changed. Now there's more awareness. Uh, for example, the Nalet discussion, if we were gonna spray through it by air, I aired, or how, how is it gonna happen at first, even though we didn't use Nalet, uh, that discussion helped uh, people to incorporate in how we can help. How we can uh, how we can contribute. We we don't want uh, air spray. Then what we have to do, and that also help a lot of uh, our people to to uh, take hands on Zika and our communities and and are serving our 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 country. Now we have more knowledge of the virus. 
Now we know that it can be transmitted by a mosquito bite or through sex. Uh, it, it has uh, been associated with, with congenital birth defects and with Jan Guillain Barre syndrome. Uh, the fact that people started to know someone that had Zika uh, become uh, not only a, a true fact for us, now people stop saying, I don't know anyone with Zika, and now we are saying, I know someone that already had it. Um, finally, people are more committed. We are more educated, and there's less uh, skepticism around the, the country. Next one, please. Uh, that's probably going to be, it's happening already, I, I bet, in Florida or in the, in the uh, spots of Zika that you have in, in the United States, in the continental U, United States. And there were, at first in Puerto Rico, many misconceptions uh, of how, at first, people, you can hear, you, someone could say, all of my friends that gave birth this year, their babies didn't come out with my microcephaly. That Zika is a hoax. And although it is true that so far in Puerto Rico we have less microcephaly due to Zika, we have only one case uh, confirmed, we now know that it's not only microcephaly that we have to be concerned about. We have to be uh, aware of the other problems associated with Zika, miscarriage, stillbirth, hearing and eye defects. And that uh, when people in the country, you know, are, congregations and in our communities, they, heard that, they, they hear that those are possible symptoms. Uh, there is one, one, one good thing that we Puerto Rican have is a solidarity. We know how to help each other and we know how to overcome adversities. And when people start listening that that could happen to anyone they love or from their congregations or from their communities, then people started more in, more in, uh, believing more about Zika and uh, the comments that if it's, it's a hoax, a hoax that's, that's no longer here. We know it's true, and, and I humbly suggest that please don't, don't take uh, the light side about that, that belief because uh, usually with, with time, it's not going to be a hoax anymore, and we don't want not even one baby or one uh, uh, ch ch child going through things that if we only could go and do all the prevention that we know we can do, that we could avoid it that. Um, the fact that uh, it's not only microcephaly, uh, it, it's very important to, to keep in mind, because at this time, we, not even Brazil can truly know how Zika is going to affect healthy newborns. Uh, for that reason, our government uh, has created a three-year vigilance period for any newborn whose mother has Zika while pregnant. Uh, in, in addition, the government implemented guidelines for every pregnant woman, and the obstetrician community is working to follow these guidelines. Next one. Now we know that, sorry. Second um, misconception, residents of Puerto Rico are not ignorant of Zika. We protect all year against mosquitoes, of all kinds, but these articles about Zika in Puerto Rico are very strange to us. We do not see that that is reality. We have not seen thousands of cases. This is very strange, and it seems like an agenda of some kind. The truth is that, at first, everyone wasn't familiar with Zika. Zika is not dengue or chikungunya, like chikungunya is not dengue. Although they share a common vector, who is a mosquito, the, they all are different and the perception that the three are alike has changed. In our case, for every two confirmed cases of Zika, there are eight people who were infected but did not develop symptoms or only had mild symptoms and did not seek medical care. But if there is one thing that people are more concerned about, it is the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, what I'm trying to, to point is that uh, of course, people are going to start thinking that Zika is, is, is either not in our communities, uh, because most of us, if we had it, will not develop symptoms. So in, in that case, we don't have to be overconfident about the disease, thinking that it's not here or that it's not in your area, because it's already, it, it could be. Only you weren't sick enough to go to the doctor. 
So that, that's really something important that we have to, to seek uh, is real. It is a threat. And if we don't take care of it and if we don't start being proactive and working in our congregations and in our communities, then we will be uh, handling, uh, hopefully not, uh, really, really difficult times. The next one. And now we know that Zika is not only transmitted through mosquito bites, but also through sex. It is associated with serious birth defects and in newborns. The future of our country. If we care about our future, we have to take care about our new newborns and our pregnant women. And our, that's no, religious people in our communities. We, we take care and believe and take pride of how we take care of each other. And, and it, we have to be sensible for, sensible for these populations. And we have to be there, be there for them before they, uh, they are, before they are born. It means uh, while they are in the in the womb of their mothers, uh, even if we we also know that if even if we use insect repellent, not everyone follows the instructions on the label. Not everyone, not every house has box screens. Not everyone uses mosquito nets, and not everyone removes standing water in their surroundings. Uh, I can tell you from our experience, we have uh, dengue. We have chikungunya, and they've been, they've been in, our, in our island for quite a while. And now, while there is a season of, of raining, we all well, we tend to forget that we have to go and check on our bike jars or check our community. So we have to be always aware of that. I, I do believe that this is a culture changing for our environment. We have to take care for, for, for the creation, and we have to take care of what's being created. The belief that, that we wouldn't have thousands of cases is no longer true. That was a, uh, only in early December, probably through March. That was a, a belief that was very popular in the island. But in nine months, almost 20,000 cases were confirmed by lab testing. These are the cases of people who went to a doctor or to a hospital and had, and had a blood test. And bear in mind that there is a, probably eight intent that will not develop symptoms. So uh, may, uh, you can make the math. I have an estimate of how many cases we have in the island. Next slide, please. Uh, this phrase is, is it was, uh, really common. Me and my family live in Puerto Rico. I teach nearly 100 students in a 5,000 plus student university. My wife also teaches and my daughters it goes to a nearby public school. I have seen the mosquito often, and yet I know no one who has had Zika virus. Actually, not only do I know no one who's had it, but I know no one who knows anyone who's had it. Sadly, the media are being incredibly controlling about this and this disinformation, along with sensation. sensationalism, have taken control. No one has anything to fear. I really doubt at this time that no one knows someone with Zika. For where I, where I work in the governor's office in, in El San Juan, we had like confirmed cases around 15. So we all know someone that has uh, that had Zika. Uh, now that you can know that now that you now do we know that you can have Zika and never has symptoms. Our blood banks confirm this. And currently, people are more aware of Zika because of different government initiatives. Even if sensationalism is present, the fact that Zika is here cannot be disputed. Next one, please. This is a really interesting question. How faith-based and community-based groups can implement some of the suggested activities in the Guide for Mosquito Prevention and Zika Education. In, in Puerto Rico, early in February this year, Governor Garcia Padilla, he established an executive order declaring Zika as an emergency to the public health of Puerto Rico. Ever since, our state and local municipalities have worked to, we, 
to make weekly community impacts. They consist mostly of house-to-house -house visits to detect possible places where water accumulates, inspecting the window screens, providing brochures and literature. They are also been given one-on-one -on -one education and they've been teaching how to properly eliminate mosquito breeding sites. And that's one, I'm glad that you show part of the video before, because it's not, it's not only removing water or empty or, or the water buckets, we, we have to clean the, the, the surface in order, because there could be larvae there. So the, we've been distributing, distributing insect repellent and explaining how to properly use it. We've been distributing condoms we've been encouraging our neighborhood solidarity. Next one. Uh, what examples, uh, and other, other things that we've been doing is uh, our agency have worked hand in hand in collecting car tires. So far the government has recovered over two million used car tires. Uh, billboards and media campaigns are still used and the Puerto Rico Emergency Management Director and the Secretary of Health remain constantly in the media. Every Friday we have the latest Zika report. Also the Division of Epidemiology of the Department of Health is frequently giving Zika awareness seminars to organizations all over the island. My office has given, has given plenty of those uh, seminars, uh, to, specifically to communities and, and religious leaders. And they've been at first skeptic, but now they, they, they ask for it. The people are more involved in order, they want to contribute more. And in the government, there is a campaign to install screens in pregnant women homes. And the women, infants, and children, or WIC centers, have seek a prevention kits for pregnant women. And that's, that's what the state or the government has been doing. The next one, please. What... Uh, faith-based and community-based organizations can do? Well, first of all, we have to clarify one thing, uh, and I believe that Dr. Santivan has uh, already addressed it. Although we know that using condoms help to prevent the spread of the virus, uh, the, not all faith-based uh, or community-based groups approve their usage. So I, I, that's, a, that's a topic that, that can be uh, disruptive, but nevertheless, Every faith-based and community-based group has direct relationships with their communities. Where the, the, the neighborhood uh, uh, communities and the congregations or the parishes, they are the places where people go to when they need help. So these organizations probably know more about their community, communities than the government. They, they know where the pregnant women live and the locations of places where mosquitoes live and lay eggs. The government acknowledges that these organizations are the first responders in any emergency. So in June, in June 2016, an alliance between the government and faith-based and commu community-based organizations was created. Over 100 organizations committed on what, uh, and we are working hand in hand. Next one, please. In the case of Sika faith-based and community-based groups, what we should do, what we could do, uh, first, we can develop alliances with government agencies. Uh, for example, the health department of every, uh, of every state, plus the CDC, they, they, are, they have developed wonderful, wonderful brochures and information, informational videos. We can, the community and the faith-based groups can use them in order to that. We, the, the, both communities and religious groups can sponsor SICA seminars, and they, we can hand out brochures with precise information about the disease. Uh, the, the congregations and the community groups, they could be the community educators, providing real facts and the latest information. Uh, we can establish teams that can serve as inspectors of their neighborhoods uh, weekly. It's not that one day I, I went to my backyard and I, and I checked that we didn't have uh, anything on water accumulation. We have to do that weekly. We don't have to. We have to do it weekly and constantly. And if it's raining more, then we should do it more often. Uh, the, they, the, the, these groups can also make a prevention plan if they have mission trip, mission trips, or know someone that is traveling to areas with Zika. Uh, we can also 
And this is, to me, this is the most important. Build a culture of solidarity and commitment in helping each other. We have to make Zika a citizen's issue, not a government problem. I would like to thank Seth for the opportunity and uh, thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Dr. Ocasio-Torres. We are so grateful for your um, sharing your experience in Puerto Rico and all of the hard work that you've been doing these last nine months. Thanks for sharing your experience and helping us um, be prepared for, for our next season. Yeah. We're now going to transition into our question and answer session. Um, please note that the questions specific to Florida can be submitted during the 3 o'clock um, follow-up webinar or submitted to cdcinfo at cdc.gov. To ask a question, just um, you can put it in the little video chat box um, to the left of your screen. And um, if you know who you want to ask the question to, please just indicate that in your question box. Um, we've got a couple questions already. And so here's one that I think um, Dr. Casio Torres and Dr. Santan Binez, um, you probably both are uh, equipped to answer. Um, what, we'll get Dr. Santan Binez to answer first and then go to you to share your experiences, Dr. Ocasio. Um, so what if the public, this is from Tom Jones, and he asks, what if the public refuses to believe that Zika is really a threat? Well, thank you. Good question. Um, certainly there will be people in our communities who aren't sure whether Zika actually is a threat, and uh, it's possible there are people on this call who really haven't made up their minds about that uh, yet. Um, what I will say is that uh, early in the process where we're investigating a new disease or a, uh, a disease that's just beginning to spread widely, um, uh, we want to keep an open mind. So if we think back to, like, say, a year ago, 2015, I can remember some of the conversations that scientists were having about Zika, and we were saying, you know, are, do we know that this Zika virus actually causes microcephaly? Um, are there other possible explanations? Are there other possible factors that we haven't uh, thought of? And that's really, that's an important part of the scientific process to, to think of all of those possibilities. Now, um, over time, there has been a considerable amount of, of research and, and evidence um, that uh, shows that Zika is, is a threat, that it is the cause of microcephaly. Um, as I mentioned, we have found uh, evidence of the virus particles in the brain cells of uh, fetuses with microcephaly. And um, there are other pieces of evidence that we need to uh, put together. Um, the timing of when the infection occurs relative to the, the brain development uh, lines up. So then that's another piece of evidence. Um, generally speaking, we know that uh, other types of viruses can cause some types of birth defects. So there is what we would call a, a biological uh, plausibility for this. And we've also uh, looked at some of those other possible explanations, possible other factors. And to be honest, none of them really panned out. We looked at, you know, the uh, uh, geography and timing and, um, you know, is this uh, a reasonable cause of microcephaly? And none of them were found to be um, the, the cause. So we can say that, that Zika is a, is a threat to cause uh, microcephaly. Now, um, it is important to keep an open mind and think of, of all the possibilities, uh, but it's also important to keep up on the, the research and the facts and things that we have learned uh, over the, the months of researching this. So um, I will say that as scientists, um, we're good at talking to one another. We're not always the best at communicating our findings to communities and to uh, communicating them in ways that everyday people can understand. So it's important that we do that. And that's one of the reasons we're having this call today. So we can, we can um, communicate these, these findings so people uh, understand the science and understand that this actually is, is a, a threat that we need to do something about. Thanks, Scott. Dr. Ocasio-Torres, would you like to add anything? Yes, I will answer this with an, uh, with an anecdote that I had from my kids' pediatricians. Uh, the, he was telling me before that there was a time where he used to say to, the, to different parents, 
that you should lay your children uh, face down. And then when they return to the, this is a long time ago, uh, I guess in the 80s. And then when, when th these same parents return with a newborn, he was now telling them, now you have never put your, your kids into bed uh, face down. You always have to put it uh, upside down. And then what I'm trying to say is, is that be behavior, or changing of behavior take times. But it also takes a few, a few amounts of uh, education. And uh, that's part of the commitment that, that the, we as health pastors and our communities ha have to do. We have to educate. It's not something that we should take it lightly. And from experience from other countries, uh, we, we know that we have to address it uh, uh, with the amount of uh, uh, carefulness and, and know, knowing that it's not, a, it's not something to take light. Likely, hopefully, and thankfully, we don't know what's going to happen or, or what's going to happen, but we have to be prepared. It's, it's like for a hurricane. You don't know if exactly it's going to happen to your place or if it's going to go through your, well, through your town, but you have to be prepared for it in order to avoid what? And something that we don't want to regret uh, in the future. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Um, okay, this question comes from Ebony Brooks, and she asks, what are some first steps health ministers should take when building relationships with other health leaders in their community? And I'm thinking that might be good for you again, Dr. Ocasio-Torres, since you're the reverend doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll do my best. Can, can you please repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. What are some of the first steps health ministers should take when building relationships with other health leaders in their communities? Okay. Uh, that, that really, that's really a good question. And uh, solidarity is something that uh, I, I believe that every congregation uh, knows what it is and likes, likes to uh, have like our um, mission uh, statement of, from, from where we worship. Uh, creating and developing steps uh, is as simple as, and difficult like to make an honest approach to the community. In the case of the, if it is aborting um, government uh, agencies, for example, we have, uh, we have uh, every state and, and city should have a faith-based uh, office and neighborhood uh, initiatives office. That's, uh, this, we have this one in Puerto Rico from an executive order of the ex-president George Bush. So we know how to do that. Would you go there, approach them, and then from there, if you have an initiative that you want to do in your neighborhood and in your community, what you should do is, uh, like what we all do, a sponsor, a sponsor one and approach another group. My, my, I bet that most of our uh, community groups and congregations, we will all say yes because we, they, we care about people. That's probably was, uh, that's my, my honest and, and sincere uh, answer. So it would be to, one, reach out to you, the leaders and the civic leaders who are engaging and trying to liaise, and sure. then two, have dialogue, use the health minister's guide in your congregation so that there sure. is, you grow the solidarity, you grow the community understanding, and you can find then more actors who are willing to actually speak to the issues. Yes. And then, Dr. Santa Benez, it looks like you have something to add yeah. to you. I'd like to add to that if I could, Kimberly. Um, I think that uh, it's useful to bring communities together around a, a real health issue. So Zika uh, is something that people can come together around. We've seen this with other um, diseases that have uh, affected communities, Ebola and flu, where the community comes together to keep people healthy to prevent uh, disease. We've also seen, as I mentioned, that Zika uh, can affect the most vulnerable in our communities. And so many different faith traditions, um, uh, they, they really uh, care about the vulnerable people and really have concerns and want to make sure that those people uh, are protected. So that's a common uh, theme that people can rally together around. Sure. 
Super. Thank you. We have a, a number of questions. So uh, participants, we are going to go just a bit over because we have the delay in starting. Um, we understand if you have to leave, this is rec being recorded, but we do want to get to all of your questions. Um, another question comes from Mimi Kaiser, um, and she asks, should those returning from Zika areas, such as a mission trip, take extra bite prevention measures for a certain time period so that they won't be unintentionally sharing an unknown infection um, while they're in the U.S. Scott, I think that's a great question for you. So it's when people are returning from a, a, a Zika-infected area, whether it's for a mission trip or any other travel, um, what, what precautions should they take? Well, of course, so the, the biggest precaution in terms of uh, mission trips, uh, the danger would be for a, a pregnant woman potentially going to an area that had uh, ongoing Zika transmission. So um, uh, particularly for, for a woman who's, who's pregnant or could become pregnant, we would advise her to, um, you know, know where those areas of active transmission are happening and, and uh, potentially, you know, uh, avoid those areas or avoid mosquitoes if she must go to those particular uh, areas. Um, the, the risks for people who aren't pregnant are um, much less. As I mentioned, most people don't have symptoms or they only get mild disease. And the potential risk there is that if they were to, to come back and be carrying virus for a short period of time and potentially getting bitten by a mosquito that could spread to someone else. But the, the risk is, is much less for them than it would be for uh, pregnant women. Um, and so we, we recommend that uh, the travelers use repellent for uh, three weeks on return uh, to keep from uh, uh, infecting mosquitoes on their, uh, in their home community. Okay, great. So like if, if a, a, somebody travels to Brazil on a mission trip and they return, they should be using some, some type of insecticide spray or lemon oil or whatever for about three weeks. Yes, an EPA-registered insect repellent. An EPA-registered insect repellent. Okay, perfect. Um, another question. Um, how much does a Zika test cost for a pregnant woman, and is it covered by insurance? Um, hopefully we have that answer. I think that's a question for you, Dr. Santavin, yes. Uh, yeah, so that, that is a, a good question. Um, we, we want to make sure that those Zika tests are available, but um, we don't want tests to be used up by people who are um, what we would call worried well, who, you know, really don't have any, any risk and are just curious if they've gotten infected. We want those um, uh, reserved for uh, uh, people who are really at risk. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of communication resources on CDC's website, and one of them is, you know, should you get a, get a Zika test? And so there, there are limits in who uh, the test would be recommended uh, for, so you can look at those guidelines to tell whether you're appropriate to get the test, and then you can check with your local health department about uh, whether you would need to be tested. Great, thanks. And, and um, another question, um, how can I respond if my community asks me to weigh in on whether I consider aerial spraying, or sorry, aerial spraying with NALD to be an effective way of getting rid of mosquitoes? And what are the side effects of aerial spraying? And I, I'm not sure who, who might know the answer to that. I'm guessing Dr. Santa Benez, but maybe Dr. Ocasio-Torres as well. Well, I, I will um, say a few things and see if my colleague also wants to, to uh, join in. Um, sure. When it comes to, to aerial spraying, I, I approach this uh, as I would as, as a primary care physician. And so I think of, you know, any time we want to use any type of chemical or, or substance and people are involved, uh, um, you know, uh, this could be a medication or uh, a pesticide, for example, uh, and I want to think about, is there a reason for doing this, for giving this? And if the answer to that question is yes, then have we done everything we can to minimize any potential risk from this? So, you know, before I would give someone Tylenol for a headache or uh, prescribe an antibiotic for a bronchitis, I would want to know, is there a reason for doing this? Uh, and with Zika, we've seen that the, there is a reason that, that Zika um, 
uh, is a, a cause of microcephaly. So there, there is a reason for it. Um, have we done everything to minimize any potential risks? Well, with the pesticides that we, we use for spraying, um, there are many decades of experience with these, and they have shown to be safe and effective when they're used as, as directed. They've been used uh, during other uh, mosquito seasons and uh, have not caused uh, uh, side effects or uh, major problems. In addition to that, knowing that, that it is safe and effective if, if used as directed, um, this is used as part of what we call an integrated mosquito control program. So it's not just the spraying, uh, it's many uh, uh, different uh, approaches to controlling mosquitoes. So it's, uh, as we mentioned in, in the uh, video and we both talked about, uh, identifying those areas with standing water where mosquitoes breed and uh, turning over that water and cleaning up those areas. So that will decrease uh, the mosquito burden. Uh, it's using local repellents and other ways of minimizing mosquitoes. And the spraying is really used uh, when the number of mosquitoes is, is very high and we need to reduce the number of mosquitoes uh, very quickly. So it's kind of reserved for um, you know, when these other measures uh, haven't really been enough. Oh, well, thank you. Um, we have a lot of good questions here, and um, we, we'll try and get to all of them um, via email if we can figure out how to reach back to you. Um, but we've, we have run out of time, so I, I, I just want to punctuate on the answer to that last question. The activity guide really gives a lot of instruction for what uh, communities can do to help uh, uh, alleviate the, the mosquito threat um, or, you know, at least tamper it down with um, vector control uh, sure. activities. And we encourage you, please, to uh, engage in those activities, particularly if you live in a Zika-infected area. Um, though, obviously, um, we, we will meet the aerial spraying um, when used as directed is safe, and so we want folks to feel safe also when communities are in need of that. Um, well, thank you for your time today. We're grateful to have launched this Health Minister's Guide. We're open to your feedback. We're trying to make tools that work best for you. So please um, reach back out to the Partnership Center if you have questions or thoughts or comments or concerns, and you can always reach back to the CDC at cdcinfo at cdc.gov. Thank you all so much, and have a wonderful day.